Hello, welcome to EPG Pathshala. I'm Aparna from IIT Bombay. And in this module, we are going to talk uh, about colonial capital from paper sociology of urban transformation. The learning objectives of this module uh, are, uh, in this module, we'll study the growth of Kolkata and Delhi as seeds of imperial power. In this section, we consider different ways in which Kolkata and New Delhi developed as colonial capitals. And we'll also discuss how and why political power was represented through architecture, which defined the visual aspect of both cities. Further, in this module, we are also going to assess the role of migration in the growth of in the growth and development of Kolkata and Delhi uh, through a few case studies that are historical and, and contemporary. We will be outlining how urban development became the buzzword in both uh, cities in the post-colonial period. And we'll also consider some measures that were or are uh, taken to develop these cities. And we initiate a debate to understand to what extent these were successful. And finally, we'll be presenting the debates around ideas of the global city and look at the implications of imagining Kolkata and Delhi as world cities. Taking all these four aspects, which are the trajectories of urban histories of Kolkata and Delhi that how these two cities grew as seats of political and economic power. These cities exhibit unequal development. Therefore, it becomes pertinent to explore how and why these cities exhibit inequality and unequal development. Kolkata initially grew from a cluster of villages to a key port of the British Empire and was later turned into, uh, into the capital whereas Delhi was purposely planned and built to be the new capital of British India. So although both cities share histories of being colonial capitals, the development trajectories of Kolkata and Delhi followed rather different paths. There are extreme contrasts in between these cities, but they have several commonalities. These cities bore the burden of a large number of refugees that arrived as a result of the turmoil surrounding partition and independence in 1947, which changed the demography and urban structure of these cities considerably. Through the 1960s and 1970s, Kolkata struggled with declining industrialization that affected the economy of the city. At the same time, there was an apathy that typified municipal governance in the city. And Kolkata quickly acquired the epithet of a dying city. In contrast, Delhi continued to be the center of political power. Although it did have uh, its shares of bad governance, it was never seen as a city in decline. In recent times, both Kolkata and Delhi have been trying to emulate other world cities in various ways that recreates pockets of global experience. To understand the different ways in which Kolkata, which was known as Calcutta till 2001, and New Delhi developed as capital cities, and also the regions behind the shift of the capital city, one has to understand the different processes that marked both stages of colonialism. That is, the first stage, which is marked by the dominance of the East India Company, and the second stage as part of the British Empire. The Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 seriously undermined the political capabilities of the company and its rule, which was ended by placing Queen Victoria as the sovereign of India. From this point onward, an imperialist ideology was used as a political symbol of control and rule. Urban planning was used extensively to translate the political symbols of imperialism into visible form. Kolkata became the colonial capital because of its strategic location along that trade route. Whereas New Delhi was deliberately planned with a deeper political ambition of imprinting British imperial rule in India. However, there are contrasting ideas and opinions that exist about the level of planning intervention in Kolkata. On one hand, as Rudyard Kipling has described Kolkata as chance directed, chance erected, laid and built on the silt palace by hovel poverty and pride side by side. On the other hand, 
despite the haphazard impression of the city in Kipling verses, Partho Datta notes that Kolkata had not only been planned, it had been severely planned. However, both viewpoints reflect different aspects of urban development in Kolkata during colonial times. Although Kolkata was at the time the headquarters of the East India Company, Cotton in 1904 points out there was little thought of territorial power or in the mind of the factors of those days. The prosperity of the traders led them to build beautiful houses along the river banks which earned the city the grand title of city of palaces. But this title did not have any imperial connotation. The palaces were grand and showy houses demonstrating economic power but in no way they did come to signify political power as Jaini Energy has argued. So various communities and not just the British benefited from the economic growth and an embarked an orgy of speculation in private houses. By the end of the 18th century, Kolkata had emerged as the second city of the British Empire. However, unplanned growth had led to municipal problems such as overcrowding and unhealthy drainage. Problems began to be addressed during the times of Lord Wellesley who appointed an improvement committee in 1803 to look into the developments of, of Kolkata. While improving health and sanitation was the principal motive for various plans, it also led to different changes in the indigenous neighborhood patterns that were typified by winding lanes and a close knit structure. The changes that were introduced in the urban space of Kolkata were not simply part of improvement and beautification projects but also a tool to control colonial subjects. By the 1850s, debates around the shift of the capital city had already begun and coincided with the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857. Bernard Cohen suggests that the relationship of authority between the colonizer and the colonized underwent significant changes around the time of the mutiny. Similarly, Cohen further argues that previous attempts of governor generals to impose authority in the imperial framework of the Mughals led to a contradiction in the cultural symbolic constitution. By 1877 and 1911, three coronation ceremonies or darbars were held in Delhi. The first was the imperial assemblies in 1877 that crowned Victoria as the Empress of India. The second and third took place in 1903 that is the coronation of Edward VII and 1911 coronation of George V. These darbars consolidated the image of Delhi as an imperial city and paved way for the construction of a colonial capital. Writing on Delhi between the two empires, Narayani Gupta points out that the city acted as a strategic gateway to, into India. Narayani Gupta describes the 1911 Darbar as Bashahi Mela and compares George V and his consort to a 20th century Mughal couple. To explain the way New Delhi looks today, one has to understand the need of the imperial powers to create a sense of power through visual means. Whereas the Darbars recreated the necessary pomp and pageantry to highlight rituals of power, import of town planning ideas from England ensured the implementation of health and sanitation measures. As Irving comments, the enlightened planning and homogeneous clarity of the New Delhi formed to British eyes a symbolic contrast with the heterogeneous confusion and narrow twisted byways of the existing cities. From the hexagonal layouts of the roads, the broad avenue and the clear lines of classical architecture used to build the Viceroy's house which is now the Rashtrapati Bhavan. The debates around planning New Delhi belied the political ambitions associated with colonial rule. The contrasting landscapes of the old and New Delhi continue to mark the way the city appears even today. 
migration in both historically and in contemporary sense has significantly altered the urban landscape of Kolkata and Delhi. Whether seen through particular waves of migration at specific times in history or through a continuous process, migrants have influenced the social and economic aspects of the cities. So in this section, we bring three different examples of migration to Kolkata and Delhi and explain how these have shaped the characteristic feature of the other cities. First, we examine the migration of communities from outside India to Kolkata during the colonial times, such as Armenians, Chinese, Jewish and Parsi, and see how they contributed to the cosmopolitan nature of the city. Second, we focus on a large wave of migration to both Kolkata and Delhi during partition, which defined the urban future of the city. Thirdly, we bring out regional migration, particularly from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh to Kolkata and Delhi. Like many other colonial port cities of the world, Kolkata was an important node in the trade and migration routes. As a second city, that is after London of the British Empire, Kolkata attracted a range of migrants from across India as well as outside. Most of these migrant communities such as Armenians and Parsis had arrived in India much before the colonial period and came to Kolkata to expand their trading network that carried among other goods like opium to China and other places in East Asia. Each of these communities created its own network of educational institutions, places of worship and sites of socialization that shaped the landscape of Kolkata. Apart from community institutions and building, many of the wealthier merchants, particularly from Armenian and Jewish communities, built huge mansions and made money in the real estate. Esplanade Mansion and Chaurangi Mansion, for example, were built by Elias David Joseph Ezra. Most members of these communities live or lived in and around central Kolkata and shaped the neighborhood landscape of the city. Kolkata, for example, is the only city in India to boast of two China towns, one in central Kolkata near Bobazar and the other in Tangara. Alongside the above-mentioned communities, Kolkata was also the site of one of the largest Anglo-Indian communities. As a community of mixed descent, Anglo-Indians have a special fondness for Kolkata, which was once their political, social and cultural heart. Delhi, like Kolkata, was also located along a trade route. This trade route, over the period of hundreds of years before colonialism, brought in several communities from West and Central Asia who understood the strategic location of the city. Some of the communities, such as the Mughals, left an indelible impact on the city's landscape and history. However, unlike Kolkata, Delhi has never been described as a cosmopolitan city. Instead, given the presence of a large expatriate community in the present times as well as diverse group of regional migrants, Delhi's cosmopolitanism is more contemporary. Migration and the urban landscape, partition migration and the cities. Partition is a major turning point in the history of both Kolkata and Delhi. It is estimated that in the aftermath of partition, uh, around 15 million people crossed the western border between India and Pakistan, whereas several million uh, millions crossed the eastern border. Many of them made their way to Kolkata and Delhi. The arrival of such large number of refugees posed a huge challenge to the urban municipalities and in the immediate aftermath, the cities had to deal with sheltering problem of refugees. Writing about the plight of Muslim refugees in Delhi, Gyanendra Pante mentions that overnight Delhi turned into a refugee stand. Refugee camps such as Kingsway Camp in Delhi and Cooper's Camp in the outskirts of Kolkata, they were initially set up to to house these people who streamed into the city. While many of these older camps were makeshift ones and were later dismantled, other more permanent settlement colonies in the cities were set up by the government. For example, several upmarket neighborhoods in South Delhi such as Kalkaji, Lajpat Nagar and Malvia Nagar were created by the Ministry of Rehabilitation as resettlement colonies. Chitranjan Park, for instance, or Sierra Park as it is known popularly, it was 
specifically developed in 1960, particularly for the Bengali community, uh, which was displaced from the East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. See, a park which was initially called East Pakistan Displaced Persons EPDP colony has grown into the Bengali neighborhood of Delhi, although other communities have also recently moved in in that colony. Faridabad was developed as an industrial hub and a refugee colony by Nehru for the large number of people who migrated from Pakistan. In Kolkata, on, on the other hand, the lacks of funds and cooperation from the central government did not allow the state government to construct many such colonies in the city. In its teeth, refugees squatted on large tracts of empty land in the south of the city, for example, in the areas of Jadhapur, Bijoygarh, and Netaji Nagar, uh, which, like the Delhi, have developed into middle class neighborhoods. Uh, we will uh, now discuss about the regional migration to Kolkata and Delhi so in order to better understand the pattern uh, in which both of these uh, cities have followed in terms of development. The presence of a large migrant population in both Kolkata and Delhi, uh, it became a focus of development debates. Historically, both Kolkata and Delhi have been important industrial hubs. Uh, they were also political capitals. Regional migration has influenced the social fabric of the cities considerably over time. For example, in Kolkata, the Marwari, Gujarati, Tamil and Punjabi migrants came as traders, businessmen and officials in the colonial administration. Uh, similarly, migrants from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh came mainly as laborers to work in the jute and paper mills that formed an important part of Kolkata's economy in colonial and also in post-colonial period. Interestingly, most of these communities, uh, they have created residential enclaves of their own. Uh, for example, uh, Lake Market and its surrounding areas de developed as a South Indian enclave uh, and uh, Bhavan Jopur, it became chosen location for the Gujarati as well as uh, for the Punjabi community. And Bura Bazaar developed as the residence come business area for the Marwari community. So this led to the well-known anthropological and uh, anthropologist N.K. Bose to describe Kolkata as a premature metropolis. Uh, Bose notes uh, that although Kolkata neighborhoods were often mixed in terms of class, uh, people usually tended to cluster together based on their ethnicity. Writing about post-colonial governmentalities surrounding urban development of Delhi, Stephen notes, the colonial project grew slowly out of economic exploitation and political manipulation. It did not necessarily begin with a dramatic rupture. And it has certainly not added with, despite this, there have been attempts to serve patterns of economic and social dependency. One of the most explicit attempts to sever these links with the past is that of development. So urban policies aimed at putting Delhi and Kolkata on the development path have involved a wide range of issues from addressing poverty to infrastructure development. In the immediate post-independence period, the cities grappled with the issue of deindustrialization, particularly in Kolkata where commercial decolonization began in the 1960s, along with the declining importance of Kolkata port, which affected traditional industries such as jute and paper mills. Continuing deindustrialization through the 1970s and 1980s in Kolkata added to the economic woes of the cities. Poverty became synonymous with Kolkata, and much of the urban development plans were aimed at improving the conditions of the city. Along with the myth of the dying city, Kolkata was also swamped with images of poverty. In his, who think in his book, The Rumor of Calcutta, that is tourism, charity and poverty of representation, analyzes a range of narratives from literature, maps, back papers, stories and missionary work. While Delhi did not have an image issue like Kolkata, there were concerns around improving the civic conditions in the city. The image of the city was, of course, a primary concern 
for urban developers. So in this section, we examine whether urban development plans in Delhi and Kolkata have successfully tackled poverty or created more marginalization in the cities. The Delhi Development Authority, that is DDA, the organization that is responsible for development of Delhi, was formed in 1955. And since then, a range of housing and infrastructure projects have been implemented. A Delhi Master Plan was formulated in 1962 to ensure an organized and planned development of the city, which was subsequently modified a few times. However, the complex history of the city and continuous migration confirmed that there were gaps between the plans and implementation process. As Amita Vavishkar points out, Delhi's master plan envisaged a model city, prosperous, hygienic and orderly, but failed to recognize that this construction could only be realized by the laborers of the large numbers of working poor for whom no provision had been made in the plans. In this article, Bhavishkar narrates the story of a young migrant Dilip who lived in her neighborhood in Delhi and who was beaten to death by some house owners and policemen for defecating in the local park. The story effectively portrays the struggle over urban space between the middle class and the poor population and that have defined implementation of urban development plans. Many such struggles have often been around claims for a space of dwelling in the city and have played out at different historical periods. During the emergency, that is from 1975 to 1977, large-scale demolitions of slums forcibly removed people from parts of Old Delhi to the marshy parts of East Delhi. Emma Tarlo has written about how Juggi, that is the slum inhabitants in Silampuri, narrated their history in Delhi through such events. In later parts too, such as during the Asian Games in 1982 and the Commonwealth Games 2010, large-scale evictions have taken place. What is missing from many of the debates around urban development in Kolkata and Delhi is the admission that the presence of slums in these cities are related to the failure of planning in the first place. Reviewing slum devolution policies in Delhi since the 1970s, Venric Dupont comments that, despite its initial stated good intention to integrate people with low incomes into the urban fabric, the public policy of urban planning and housing implemented by DDA failed to meet the demand of the poorest section of the population. The sheer number of evictions shows that the urban governance in Delhi has not been an inclusive one. In Kolkata, where slums have formed part of the popular image of the city, a different political scenario resulted in a slightly different trajectory for some dwellers. Governed by the left front between 1977 and 2011, a kind of urban populism existed in Kolkata, whereby squatters through complicated political bargains and negotiations established tennis access to land, livelihood and shelter. Partha Chatterjee explains such negotiations as demand of political society. He marks the difference from the notion of civil society where negotiation would be between the state and its citizens. In the case of Indian cities, Chatterjee points out a complex relationship between population groups and governmental agencies that administer policies that shape the development of a community identity. Despite such arrangements, however, since the late 1990s, several eviction measures have taken place in Kolkata, many of which have been in the eastern fringes of the city. A new economic policy approached, characterized by aggressive capitalism led to new development in this part of the city and set up contestations between original and new settlers. In her book, City Requiem, Ananya Roy examines these new economic and political developments in Kolkata and explores the dynamics of gender and class in persistence of poverty. Using post-colonial theoretical ideas, in her book, Roy describes how poverty in these areas 
is reproduced through narratives that are gendered as well as classed. In this sense, Roy highlights the importance of ideas and narratives around poverty and marginalization that reinforce its presence in cities. The move towards economic liberalization since the 1990s is perhaps nowhere more evident than in the Indian cities. Restructuring of the economy and opening up the market to the world have introduced social changes that have left a deep impact within a short span of time. As shopping malls become more and more ubiquitous and greasy, more housing developments sprout in the hitherto uninhabited areas. The Indian city strives to look and become more global. Kolkata and Delhi have joined this bandwagon too, although the scale and pace at which the cities have witnessed change is different. So in this section, we study how Kolkata and Delhi are striving to become global cities and what it means for its residents. The 2011 Commonwealth Games was an occasion for Delhi to showcase its global ambitions to the world. Backed by the DDA's master plan for Delhi 2021 or Vision 2021, the city geared up to introduce massive changes in the way the city looks. The metro rail project was given a push by the Delhi government and it was completed to revolutionize transport in the city. Other changes as the construction of luxury super malls and residential complexes had been afoot for a while. But as Du points, points out, this dream of Delhi as a global city also led to large-scale displacement and eviction drives. The cleansing drive directed towards slums and undesirable elements further increased socio-economic divide in city. The political process through which these changes took place also underwent significant changes as the state intervened in the matters of urban affairs, thus creating a political impetus for turning Delhi into a global city. In his recent book, Asher Gettner, Ruled by Aesthetics, World Class City Making in Delhi, argues that Aesthetic norms replaced mapping and surveying, which are the traditional tools to administer space. In other words, visual aspects of the city, of what looks good and what does not look good, have become the defining parameter through which the urban spaces are judged. Aesthetics thus added a rationale for further slum clearing. Musing about these changes that are taking place, Partha Chatterjee asks whether Indian cities are becoming more bourgeoisie. Chatterjee's question is caused in the changes in the political process that have taken place, but can also be extended to, the, to question the rush of Indian cities to claim a global status. While Kolkata did not get a push like the Commonwealth Games in Delhi, its political leadership does not want to remodel it as London. Beautification of the riverfront and construction of a giant wheel such as the London Eye are part of such a plan. The rapid changes that are taking place on the eastern fringes of the city are perhaps more indicative of Kolkata's ambition to achieve a global status. Pablo Bose analyzes the changes that have taken place over the past decades in these parts of the city. Analyzing the development of new housing and the environment debates that surround construction of a wetland area, both traces the desire of Kolkata to become a global city to its diasporic connections. So let us now summarize what we have learned in this module. Beginning at the colonial period and tracing the development of these two cities, Kolkata and Delhi, uh, till their current ambition to be global cities, this module traced a historical timeline through which Kolkata and Delhi have passed. So let us see what we have covered in this module. And uh, we have traced the development of Kolkata and Delhi through four key ideas that have influenced the city's histories as colonial capitals. The first section uh, looked at the debates that surrounded the political decisions to shift the capital from Kolkata to New Delhi. An analysis uh, uh, was a uh, focused on how different kinds of planning in the early and late colonial periods influenced the interventions and developments in urban space. 
In the second section, we discussed different waves of migration that shaped Kolkata and New Delhi. We have also looked at both historical and contemporary migration to understand how the cities engaged with these different strands of migration and how these gave rise to specific neighborhoods and social spaces in the cities. In third section, we have focused on, uh, on urban developmental issues and particularly a poverty and discussed how certain groups, migrant or otherwise, have become marginalized in these cities. Finally, the issue of marginalization is also discussed where we discuss the idea of Delhi and Kolkata as global cities and consider uh, whether such developments are inclusive. Thank you.